Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to have you all here for the third installment and keynote speech in our um, symposium on who should prosecute um, the challenge of terrorism and the response of international law. Did I get that right, Silas? <laughs> Um, I'm especially delighted to um, welcome here today our keynote speaker, Professor Amos Giora, um, who, um, as many of you may know, is truly one of the giants in the field of national security and counterterrorism. Uh, he is professor of law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City and ha, um, has written numerous articles and books on topics ranging from counterterrorism, operational counterterrorism, interrogation, detention, religion and terrorism, um, and so on. I won't bore you with the list. Uh, before coming to the States and taking up a post in academics, uh, Professor Giora served for 19 years in the Judge Advocate General's Corps of the Israeli Defense Forces, where he held numerous senior command positions, including legal advisor to the Gaza Strip, um, Judge Advocate General for the Navy, and for the Home Front Command and commander of the IDF School of Military Law. He has extensive experience at the table, so to speak, of um, counterterrorism policy, law, um, operational decision making, intelligence work. And um, we're delighted to have him here to talk about the topic of how international law can respond to terrorism, whether international trials are the right response, and what questions we should be thinking of as we ponder those issues. Let me also tell you that after the talk, um, Professor Giora's latest book, Freedom from Religion, Rights, and National Security, put out by Oxford Press, is going to be available um, for purchase over on the side and for book signing. And so without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Giora. Do I stand here? Do I stand here? I can walk wherever I want to. Good afternoon. I used to say good afternoon back. Good afternoon. Lori, they're not very. Welcome to Atlanta. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So we're going to talk about terrorism. This is terrible. Do I need this thing? Uh, you do. I do. <laughs> Welcome to Atlanta. All right. <laughs> you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Terrorism, human rights, international law, domestic law. Take notes because you'll remind me at the end what else I promise to talk about. <laughs> Morality and basic decency. So I'm going to begin with the last one. The United States, directly or indirectly, is holding, as we speak, somewhere around 25,000 post 9 11 detainees. Now, there's a long discussion about are they illegal belligerents, are they legal belligerents, are they enemy belligerents. Are they good looking? Are they bad looking? Whatever they are, at the end of the day, these are human beings. You know, memo to Obama, these are human beings. 25,000. Now, that number is obviously changes all the time, and so do the people sometimes, sometimes come, people go, people are released, people are detained, people are, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, keep in mind throughout this talk, 25,000 people. They're held in Guantanamo, they're held in Bagram, they're held in Abu Ghraib, they're held in, you know, wherever. Eight and a half years after 9-11, it is astonishing to old people like me, because I think I'm just about the oldest person in this room, it is astonishing. It, that always gets a response. <laughs> it's, I find it astonishing that eight and a half years, actually we're now more than eight and a half, we're now on the 15th of March, right? So it's eight and a half plus four days after 9-11. We're still asking ourselves as an American society this extraordinarily basic question, what do we do with these guys? And so I begin with that long introduction and turn to Silas and say, you are truly to be congratulated for pulling this thing off and bringing a variety of people who really are knowledgeable, different opinions, different perspectives, and doing this as I understand over the course of three different sessions, four different sessions, four different sessions. I think it's a really interesting idea. 
But at the end of the day, we do have to ask ourselves, how do we go forward? So we can sit here and we can bash the Bush administration for some of their actions. They obviously deserve to be bashed. We can bash the Obama administration. And I will say we increasingly need to bash the Obama administration for failing philosophically, intellectually, legally to address this most basic of questions. Do we try these people? And if yes, where? And if no, what are the options? We'll talk about the options also. We also need to be very honest about the United States Congress. I'm told there is a Congress in Washington, right? So over the course of the past eight and a half years, whichever Congress, right, it's four Congresses, right, have uniformly and collectively failed, legally, morally, intellectually. And at the end of the day, there is something called the Supreme Court. Some, some of you are law students, right? So there's no doubt, at least from my perspective, the Supreme Court, because we're in the business of grading, gets a pretty bad grade also, because it has failed to articulate a clear and concise and precise position. So who are these people who were, we've detained? And why are they in detention? Let's begin with those who are in the bed and breakfast in Guantanamo. Even though Obama, when he was running for president, everybody remembers he was running for president, he said, when elected, I will close Guantanamo. Right? He made that promise. OK. And then he got elected. And then on January 21st, one day after the uh, inauguration, he signed this executive order which said that within half a year, there'll be three different task forces who will come and report to me on the closing of Guantanamo, uh, articulating a detention paradigm and articulating an interrogation paradigm. Three different task forces. Um, I, was, I actually was, I testified in front of these, one of these task forces. I was flown in from Israel, so I testified. And we're now in March, and Guantanamo is no closer to being closed today than it was you know, half a year ago or a year ago or a year and a half ago. Why? because the administration following in the footsteps of its predecessor is fundamentally incapable of answering what to do with them and who are they. Some people call them terrorists. Okay, so because thanks to Silas, you're stuck with me until about 6, 6.30, right? So here's what terrorism is according to me. Terrorism is an act by an individual or by individuals intended to advance a cause. I identify four causes, political, economic, social, and religious, and hence the book which Laurie mentioned, The Freedom from Religion. And by advance, in order to advance a cause, the terrorists, the actors, are willing to harm innocent individuals, kill innocent individuals, take their property, intimidate them, whatever, in order to reach an end. The end is the, the, uh, the cause. The means are the innocent civilians. They don't care if you all die over here, or if you die, or even if you in the back. They just don't care, because the whole point is to achieve some kind of a cause or an end game. So that's what terrorists are. There is a long debate, you know, are the Taliban terrorists, are the Taliban this, or are the Taliban that? And I go back to what I said earlier. That's, I think, in many ways an irrelevant question. Now, I know that not everybody agrees with me as to the irrelevance of the question, because at the end of the day, they are not POWs. They're not prisoners of war. They are not criminals. So they fall into this huge gray. And if you're a POW, as everybody knows, if they take an international law, you can try a PW, POW only if he's committed a war crime or a crime of captivity. And if, are they criminals? Are they like somebody who steals my car? I would say, no, they're different from somebody who steals my car. They're not a POW, so they are in this, this enormous gray. So what do we do with this enormous gray? Well, we set up um, not only the bed and breakfast in Guantanamo, but the bed and breakfast in, in Abu Ghraib and in, in uh, Bagram with the idea, I think, of detaining them. We'll talk in a second why we detain them. And then subjecting them to various interrogation measures. I take you back to John Yu and Jay Bybee's memos about the, the uh, torture-based regime, and then what? Huge, and then what? So let's first of all talk about why we detain somebody. Have any of you been involved in military counterterrorism, operational counterterrorism, counterintelligence? No? Are any of you terrorists? No, OK. <laughs> People in this business are largely detained for the following reasons. One, because they were caught in the act. But that's the minority. The minority are not caught in the act of doing something. The overwhelming majority of people who are detained are detained because somebody ratted them out. Somebody went to the authorities and said, you, sir, I know that you did such and I might mean, I don't pick on you. OK, well, maybe you did, you know? So you did such and such. And then I have, had, then I have to ask myself four questions in terms of the intelligence information. Is it reliable? Is it valid? Is it viable? And is it corroborated? But I would suggest one of the great failings of the past eight and a half years, we have never consistently, we may have asked that question, we have not consistently applied that four-part test 
in determining whether or not to detain somebody, which means that we are detaining clearly people who should not be detained. And I take you back to Rumsfeld. Everybody remembers Rumsfeld, right? He'd been Secretary of Defense. He said that the people in Guantanamo are, I quote, the worst of the worst. Well, I have no idea what that means, but if the Secretary of Defense says you're the worst of the worst, that immediately clearly cast, casts aspersions on you. Rumsfeld also said that if you were to, I don't mean to pick on you, but if you were acquitted, if you were ever to be brought before a court of law, and if you were acquitted, if you're really a bad guy, no, you would not be released. So there's obviously an inherent intellectual misnomer here. On the one hand, we'll bring you to trial, and even if you're acquitted, you'll stay with us because the food's so good in Guantanamo. So we, the idea of who to detain, we created this, this large net of informant-based intelligence information that largely goes uncooperated. And if it goes largely uncooperated, it means it's based on single source information without asking ourselves that additional question about reliable, valid, and viable. So now we've got you with us. The next question is, have we established a consistent infrastructure for asking ourselves systematically, do you present a continuing threat to America's national security? It's not enough to detain you. I mean, believe me, detaining you is easy. But we have to set up some kind of an infrastructure, a systematic systemic infrastructure for determining whether or not you present this national security danger. From 2001 until Boumediene, not, these guys in large part had no real rights. I know some of you will tell me about Hamdi, Hamdan, and um, Rasul, and I'll say, you know what, not really. Boumediene begins the process of articulating some kind of a habeas process, but, here's the but, with all due respect to Boumediene and all due respect to the Supreme Court, by articulating a, a habeas process, it does not, underline, does not guarantee you a trial. There's a huge difference between habeas, which goes to status as a detainee, and trial as we know trial. So habeas says, okay, there's cause for detention. Great. And even if we review it every half a year, great. But there's a gulf, huge gulf, between determining whether or not you should be in detention and actually bring you to trial. Because at the, at the end of the day, at the end of this talk, my thesis, bless you, is predicated on the following damning indictment, that we have not created a mechanism for determining individual adjudication, or i.e. resolution of, what, of your guilt or of your innocence. Habeas, this infrastructure habeas, every six months or every year to review you, is nothing more than a very polite form of indefinite detention with the, you know, the, the how's it pronounced, the impro imprimatur of the United States Supreme Court. Charming, but bad. Okay. So having spoken with judges who were due the habeas reviews, here's what I'm told, and I have no reason not to believe them. Indeed, every half a year, they review the status of you and 24,999 other people. But here's the unanswered question. Are they constantly receiving new information? And how are they checking that new information? Or is the basis for your detention in 2010 predicated on, on information that we received about you 2001, 2002, meaning the following? Is there, are there, are there systematic updates as to the information? Or is it all based on the original cause of detention? In the overwhelming majority of cases, it's predicated on the original piece of information that, you know, Ahmed said about Muhammad that Muhammad did such and such, or whoever it was. But then we have to ask ourselves the following questions. Who's the source? So there are three kinds of intelligence-based sources in this business. One is open news. You know, the Atlanta Constitution Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, or blogs. Okay, that's open source. It's there. The second source of information is what's called Signet. Signet is signal intelligence. You know, those huge antennas in the sky, those huge dishes in the sky that read your emails before you even wrote it. And the third source of information is human intelligence, a source. Now, who's the source? Who's the person providing the information? So first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is the source objective? When he says that you did such and such, we need to ask ourselves the following. Does he have an agenda against you? Could it be, again, I don't mean to pick on you. At some point, I'll stop picking on you, OK? Were you messing with somebody's sister? I mean, that's, you know, it's bottom, it's the essence of, 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 of basic human interaction. Were you messing with his sister? Is that why he ratted you out? How do we, do we have a mechanism to check that? Do we have a systematic me mechanism to determine the reliability, not only of the information, but of the source. So let me give you some problematic statistics. 
four years ago, I was invited to come speak to the Corps of Cadets at West Point, which is, I don't know if you all have family at West Point. It's one of life's great honors, and I mean, very seriously, to come speak to the Corps of Cadets. God love them, being very serious. So I had them in front of me, and I said to them, raise your hand, but I said, don't bullshit me. How many of you can speak Arabic? Not how many of you are studying Arabic. I don't care how many of you are studying Arabic. How many of you can speak Arabic? How many hands went up? Who said none? No. Come on. Two. I said, how many of you can tell me the difference between a Sunni and a Shiite? How many hands went up? Same two. <laughs> so I turned to the commanders who were in the front row, and I said, listen, we're sending them. This is America's finest. I mean this very respectfully. We're sending them off to Iraq, because this is the time that was before Afghanistan, unprepared for battle. And precisely in the context of understanding the source, one, we don't speak the language. Two, we have no understanding whatsoever of local culture, of the local milieu, of the tribal cultures. Because I speak a lot to American soldiers, it's always reassuring to know that things have somewhat changed, but not totally changed. So I met with a guy, he's a sergeant, he was on his way to Afghanistan, and he sought me out, and he wanted to talk to me about you know, what, what was my suggestion before he goes off to Afghanistan. And he was going to be training Afghan policemen on this very issue. I said, great, what languages do you speak? And he says to me, dude, I barely speak English. And I thought, how can we send him off to train Afghan policemen in the context of gaining, gathering intelligence information if he doesn't understand the local language and if he doesn't understand any of you, all of us know, if you don't speak a local language, there's no way you can understand local culture, right? The two are, are totally intertwined. So in the context of determining who the source is and why, what's the motivation for providing the information, we today in many ways are the blind leading the blind. Right. On the other hand, we have all these 25,000 people and even, and I re deliberately repeat myself, even if we have this systematic habeas review, it is not, going back to what I said to you earlier, guaranteeing in any way final adjudication of the person's um, guilt or innocence. So that's the detention. All right, now what about interrogation? Well, clearly and obviously, we've been to we have in the past tortured people, right? I think everybody knows, this. everybody knows what waterboarding is by now. Everybody's an expert on waterboarding, right? Yes or no? No, all right, so here's what waterboarding is. As far as I know, we haven't done it to women, so I need a guy. Here's what we do. Four big guys hold you down. They take a pitcher of water, and they pour it into you. Well, one guy, sorry, there are five guys. Four guys hold you down. Fifth guy takes your jaw, pulls it down. The sixth dude takes a pitcher of water and pours it into you. So, you know, you know what happens to you then, right? You vomit. No, no, what? Hang on. First of all, you vomit. Now, the media insists on calling this, they're simulating your death. But that's absolutely incorrect, because the perspective of the dude who's being, he's not thinking to himself, oh, this is an interesting exercise of the American military. They're simulating my death. He's thinking to himself, you know, I'm going to die. Now, most of us, if you're about to die, and if I ask you, where's the bomb, you're going to tell me something, right? But in order to convince you that you're really going to tell us something, we're going to take another pitcher of water and pour that into you also. That's what waterboarding is. It's pretty unpleasant. Clearly, we waterboard. And people like me argue that's clearly torture. But there are other means of torture. You don't have to do something so horribly violent to somebody. But the torture-based interrogation regime was in play from 2001 until, I hope, no longer. Hang on. And then I immediately say to myself and to all of you, I don't know how many of you saw the front page of the New York Times today about America's rogue army in, Afgan in Afghanistan contractors Yes, no, working with the CIA. Yes, no, working with the Defense Department. Yes, no, working with not exactly clear. Conducting their own drone operations, what, rent a drone and follow some guy in Afghanistan and kill the bad guy. So this is not happening a year ago. And as I understand, this is happening now. And so this raises fundamental questions as to have we changed our policy? And you know, old people like me say, I'm not convinced. So interrogation and detention. We are, I'm told, from fourth grade civics class, that we are a nation of the rule of law. So here are some fundamental questions. One, do we extend constitutional guarantees to non-Americans, regardless of where they are held? Or do we create some kind of artificial difference between Americans and non-Americans? People held in Abu Ghraib, people held in Guantanamo, people held for a while, there were people being um, held on the Sixth Fleet, you know, traveling around the world, joining the Navy, see the world. Or do we say that they are all one and the same? On that note, I quote and cite Professor David Cole at Georgetown, who was one of the first and leading advocates 
that regardless of where you're held, if we've detained you, we owe you full constitutional guarantees and privileges and protections. There are others who insist, and maybe, I mean, I understand it, I very much disagree, that if you're held in, Af in Afghanistan, you are not to be granted basic constitutional rights. Yes, Geneva Convention protections, but not constitutional rights. Which then raises, you know, everything here shoots off to somewhere else. So one additional set of questions that we need to ask ourselves, are these domestic questions or are these international questions? Because as I understood from Silas, in many ways the whole point here is to ask yourself, does international law provide some kind of an umbrella, some kind of an intellectual, philosophical, maybe even legal underpinning to what to do with all these. So there are significant questions here. I would suggest that the chances of having the world, whatever that expression means, agree on the definition of terrorism is akin to the chances of me having long hair. It's not going to happen. So some people, in order to minimize that, have suggested creating a terror-based inter, terror international court based on some kind of a treaty, treaty-based terror international court. It sounds like a great idea. All of you who see themselves as you know, future internationalists immediately raise your hand. You get really excited about that. But here are some problems with that. It's hard to imagine the country of X that's now captured terrorist Y transfer him to some kind of an international court. Because for a series of complicated reasons, which we'll get into, Terrorism is viewed ultimately as an act against the nation state. That said, it's clearly true, obviously, that we've created tribunals, some kinds of international tribunals for, the, for the trying war crimes, war criminals, right? For a variety of reasons which are interesting to look at and to think about, there, we, most of us, not, never say everybody, differentiate and distinguish between war crimes, races like Rwanda, Sierra Leone, the former Yugoslavia, and terrorism which raises the following, one of the following, there are many questions here. Is terrorism purely an act against the sovereign? And is war crime considered to be an act against humanity? Make like a, a Chinese wall here and ask again. When Timothy McVeigh, for instance, did Oklahoma City in 93, or 92, 93? 93? 94, pick a number. <laughs> The thought of having Timothy McVeigh tried before, for instance, the International Criminal Court, if you were to come before the American, Bill Clinton at the time would come before the American people and say, my fellow Americans, Timothy McVeigh is one of the world's nastiest SOBs, but because terrorism must be viewed internationally, we're going to try him, we're going to extradite him, wrong word, but call it extradite him to the International Criminal Court and have him tried there, take my word for it, the American people would have taken their, a collective tomato and thrown it at Clinton. It would not have worked because the crime was perceived to be purely domestic. The same is true clearly with respect to the 1993 World Trade Bombers, and I think the same is absolutely true with respect to 9-11. Um, the thought of coming before the American people and saying, did the 9-11 bombers from Musawi on are akin to the guys who did horrible things in Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and therefore must be subject to some kind of an international tribunal, goes to the to the essence of sovereignty and to the essence of, of a domestic legal system. Full stop, go to the other side of the wall. Why is it that the world says, what if somebody did some really nasty things in, hey, in, in Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Yugoslavia, it's okay to bring before some kind of an international tribunal. Why is, that, why is this kosher and why is this not kosher? So some thoughts on that. It's obviously not very PC what I'm going to suggest, so I obviously um, request humbly that you all accept my apology in advance. Because Rwanda and Sierra Leone, this is terrible to say, are happening in Africa. And the, 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 the Western world, the Western Europe and America have this sense of it's okay to impose on them a regime different than the regime we impose here in the United States. Is that problematic? Of course it is. Is that some kind of a reverse racism? Well, of course it is. But I have looked at this, and I, if somebody has a better suggestion as to why we create this system here and this system here, I'm totally open to um, suggestions and recommendations. But here is what is interesting. In this regime here, there is final adjudication of status. People are found guilty or innocent. And in this system, 
is the overwhelming majority are not found guilty or innocent. Turn it on its head upside down. Of the 25,000 people who are being held worldwide, of the 400 or 500 who have been held in Guantanamo since Kingdom Come, I never remember it's either two or three of them in Guantanamo who have been convicted. Three? Three? Think about this. Three, I get my cues from Lori. Three have been, keep going, three have been convicted on this side, on this side of the wall. Here, more, under some kind of international auspices. So what does that mean going forward? There are at least four alternatives in terms of how to try them. But before we get into specifics, question number one is, do we really intend to try these 25,000? I found it very disturbing a few months ago when President Obama issued an executive order number, whatever it was, articulating, the, you know, when you peel it all off, in an indefinite detention regime for 50 high quality assets or high high value assets. So I ask myself, and I've been involved in counterterrorism for 20 years. I've been involved, as Laurie said, in some really nasty decision making. I have no idea what a high value asset is. It's a term of art that is part of my English. It's BS. Because there's been no articulation of a criteria. So I don't know how many of you take criminal procedure, but I you know, beat my students all the time with this three part test that everything must have standards, criteria, and guidelines in order to minimize as much as possible this idea of arbitrary and capricious government behavior. And we have not, eight and a half years later, begun the process of articulating standards for the detention, standards for the interrogation, and now to the punchline of the trial. Because we have not done standards, criteria, guidelines, we have Conveniently, as a society, all of us enable decision makers to fudge, escape the fundamental question of are we going to enable adjudication of their status? So we haven't. There are four different possible methods or solutions to how to go about doing this. One is to reinstitute, re implement Guantanamo, military commissions. I think most of us today would agree that Guantanamo has been an overwhelming success, cynically, and that the idea of bringing people before a military commission is just not going to be feasible politically. Nor do I see President Obama doing that for these 25,000. And I noted, I assume all of you did also, that I think it was a month ago or two months ago, this Attorney General Holder announced we're going to bring um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to um, district court in New York. Did it with great fanfare. He forgot to um, update the president, which is always a problem. And then when Bloomberg went crazy, Rahm Emanuel got pissed off with, you know, it's like children. Rahm Emanuel gets pissed off with Rahm Holder, who is now embarrassed. And then two weeks ago, the President of the United States said, it's shocking, said, I, the President of the United States, am going to decide where um, Khalif Sheikh Mohammed is going to be brought to trial. And I thought to myself, I would think the President has a couple other things to do on a daily basis other than to determine where this particular guy is going to be brought to trial. What it does tell me is the following, that there is no policy. All right, so military commissions, I think, is not a viable solution. Option number two is to bring them all before U.S. District Court. I mean, you know, Article Three courts. So let's think about that for a second. It means the following. Trial by jury for all of these guys, jury of your peers. So, <clears throat> so we're going to find peers for these guys. Well, that's, that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a misnomer. And having met with Article Three judges, I asked them the following question. You now have 25,000. They said, well, it's not 25,000. I said, you're right. Because before we get to the trial, what we're finally going to do is have standards to determine what I said earlier, which of these guys presents a threat to American national security. Take 25,000, do easy, easy math. 50% of them present a, you know, a threat, so that's 12,500. Rounded off 10,000 new defendants being brought into the, into the criminal system now with full rights in terms of confrontation clause and, and trial by your peers and so on. Is that realistic? The answer, of course, is no. All right. Option number three is the terror-based Treaty court, and I mentioned that earlier, and I think the answer to that is clearly no. And the fourth solution, which is I've been you know, one of the early advocates of, you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, we can talk about that, is the idea of creating, taking the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and turning that into some kind of a trial court. What's good about my proposal and what's bad about my proposal? First of all, the, the good, a good offense, no, the good defense, is a good offense is a good defense, a good defense is a good offense, whichever it is. So here's what's wrong with my proposal. One, I propose that in certain cases to not enable the defendant 
to have the right to confront all of his accusers. Part of these cases are going to be based, not wholly, but partially, on intelligence information, which is classified information. So I suggest the following. If, in order to bolster conviction, not to guarantee conviction, but to bolster conviction, there's a need to introduce intelligence-based information, I would do that ex parte, before the court only, obviously, meaning that I deprive the defendant and his attorney the right to have full confrontation of the accused. Is that good? No, of course not. It's bad. But is it preferable to staying in detention for another God knows how many years? I think the answer to that is yes. What about having a trial by jury with jury of your peers? So the answer to that is no, that's not going to happen. The idea then of, this, of my national security court is to have a rights-based um, court predicated on um, a civil system, not a military system, in which I guarantee some but not all rights to the defendant. The proposal has been um, lambasted by two separate groups, one from the far, from the right, never say far, one from the right and one from the left. And I feel like a referee in basketball. If both teams are telling me that, I get the, that I'm wrong, then I must be doing something right. The right lambasts me because I'm guaranteeing these guys rights. And we shouldn't let, guarantee them rights because they're all wrong still. They're all the worst of the worst. So, okay. And the left, interestingly enough, lambasts me, especially the human rights community for whom I have great respect. They lambast me because they say the following that I am creating an alternative to the Holy of Holies, Article Three Court, and by creating an alternative to the Holy of Holies, I'm denying these people inherently, intrinsically, their rights. And they add, that has never been done before in American history. So in the paper I submitted for this uh, Distinguished Symposium, I make the following comment. One, I find it, the irony is delicious. That's a phrase in the paper. That the Human Rights Committee, community, in order to preserve their, their articulation of the Constitution, is willingly and willfully denying these guys the right to a trial. I find that to be, um, I have to put that up there. Two, there have been alternative judicial forums created during the course of American history. Have some of them been bad? Of course some of them have been bad. You know, the Curran decision and the, the, the Nazi saboteurs case is a classic example. The whole idea of creating this military system, I think, was a, was a tragic mistake by the Bush administration. But one can think creatively with the following goal in mind. Goal number one is to create a rights-based regime. And two is to implement that rights-based regime. As all of you who take international law know, we can, with respect to POWs, we release them at the cessation of, cessation of hostilities, right? We can hold you forever, war is over, MacArthur, you know, the white the flag and the ceremony and all that, and then you can go home. But there's a problem. The war, misnamed, on terrorism, misnamed, is never going to end. It's a fundamentally different paradigm than the war paradigm. There will, it will never end. And precisely because it will never end, we can't say we're going to hold you until it ends, because if it never ends, that means, in essence, here we come back, indefinite detention. So if you take everything I've said here full circle, it means the following. We are clearly in violation of the law. We're in violation of international law because we are not providing a form to adjudicate guilt or innocence. Two, I don't think there's any doubt that we are in violation of what I would call constitutional privileges, protections, guarantees to the people that we've detained. Three, we are clearly in violation of basic human decency. Some of these guys are really nasty people. And some of them, we have no idea what they are. And four, there is something called geopolitics and the court of international opinion. So obviously for the former president, for Bush, the court of international opinion was something that he didn't much care for, as articulated brilliantly by his former attorney general, Gonzalez, referred to Geneva or the international law as quaint. Quaint's a lovely word. Like you think about like cocktail party, quaint. But it's not quaint. Because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if this is a system that has been systematically developed here, then there's no reason in the world why it can't be done to us. And so what's here can work there. 
So how do we go forward? So if Obama were to call me today and say, yo, Gioro, what do we do? I would say to him, with all due respect to health care and, and the budget and every other issue that's clearly on his plate today, I really do believe that an American administration that refuses to not talk the talk, I mean, talking the talk's easy, but refuses to walk the walk on human rights is doing a fundamental injustice, not only to the detainees, but also to us. Two, it requires the administration to do something that they don't seem to be particularly adept at, and that's called decision making. So in my spare time, I think as Laurie knows, I do this whole other aspect of my life called the dilemma of the decision maker, in which I, for instance, conduct simulation exercises in order to force people to really understand the dilemma of the decision maker. There's a fundamental difference between running for office and being in office. Running for office is easy. My 13-year-old can do that. But being in office and having to make those tough calls is something that this administration is similarly failing. Congress. So let me tell you a quick anecdote about Congress. I, um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Constitutional Limits on Course of Interrogation. While writing the book, it's still unclear to me exactly why or how, but I got emails from Afghanistan, from American interrogators based in Afghanistan, offering to come meet with me when I was teaching a case question in Cleveland. On their own time and dime, they would come to Cleveland, they would meet with me. They always came with somebody, you know, I think like a lawyer, I guess, to protect them. There were three conditions to the meeting. One, the door had to be closed and the shutters had to be sealed and all that. Okay. Two, that obviously this person would be in the room. And three, I could never use their real name. I never knew their name. They were all magically called Bill. I have no idea why, how that works, but they were all Bill. And they all told me the same three things. One, they had all witnessed waterboarding. Two, they knew that waterboarding was ineffective. And three, none of them had done the waterboarding. So I said to them, I said, I have no idea if C is correct, but they're very, very accurate description, far more accurate, far more detailed than what I told you here, led me to believe that actually they were involved in it. Because there are other aspects to this stuff which are pretty gruesome. As I was writing the book, I got calls from members of Congress who asked me to come to Washington to brief them on America's interrogation regime. So a member of Congress invites you to come to Washington. You know, obviously, you have to come to Atlantic, you go to Washington also. And so I met with one member of Congress, and it's important to the story. This is a very, very large guy. I mean, he literally could have played linebacker for the Falcons. And um, come into his office, you know, and he says, well, sit down. I sat down. He says, well, what do you think about Congress's role in um, the torture that's going on? And I said, well, I think you have abdicated your responsibility. And this very large man stands up and pounds the table. I said, well, you know, quick meeting. I can turn right around and go back to Cleveland. And he said, you are wrong. I said, well, I figured that out. And he says, here's where you're wrong. He said to me, member of Congress, he said, we have effing abdicated our responsibility. And I said, great. And what are you going to do about it? He said, nothing. And I said, because, he said, well, this is 2008. He said, well, listen. We've got to be thinking about you know, presidential elections. We've got to primaries and the political considerations. Political, blah, blah, blah. I thought to myself, this guy knows that we're torturing. And are we doing anything about it? No. So this idea of the rule of law, morality, decency, international law, take everything I've told you, it, got, it has to, no alternative, funnel into creating a mechanism whereby we begin, beginning today, moving forward, create a system whereby we enable these 25,000 people to be brought before a court of law to determine their guilt or their innocence. Not creating this, this habeas, half-assed system whereby we determine that, oh, we have to keep you in detention. Got that. We need to be well beyond that. Final, final word. The paper, Silas, that you've gathered from the other scholars as far as I can tell, are advocating different interpretation of a sovereign-based approach to this issue. I think at the end of the day, I think most of us are going to agree with that. That's the easy part. We all agree. OK. The question now is how? And so if I can make a pitch to you, in many ways, the next step has to be uh, to gather all of us who are in this business. And we're past the first step, that we have to do it. The how is something that fundamentally all of us who are in this, including the government, including academics, policymakers, the media, have failed to address the how. That we have not done. I think until we start doing that, we are going to be in this continual continuum 
of this gray area of saying, yes, we have legitimacy for your detention, but we, have no, we are offering you no, no option as to your adjudication of your individual responsibility. And if you think about it intellectually, the idea of you, the individual, being held in this black hole of detention with no resolution in sight after eight and a half years, I think we as a society on that get an F. So I don't know if that's good news, if that's bad news, if that's optimistic, pessimistic. But as I told both Laurie and Silas, if you invite me to speak, you at least get my unvarnished truth, my analysis of this. I think it's fabulous that you all are here. The question is, how do we create a system? Not how do we implement. How do we create and then implement? And that's something that is fundamentally missing in the discussion across the board. Uh, on that note, questions, anxieties, concerns. Unless I put you all to sleep. So they're supposed to ask a question. <laughs> we have one for each table. So um, if anyone would like to lead off. So I'm well, I'm, I don't know who you are. I'm Paul Swear. I am with you on the on the dilemma and I'm with you on the fix. But but, but the rule of law in the fix is problematic to me because it's ex post facto. You, both your criteria would have to be created after the actors have acted. And the legitimacy then of both the jurisdiction of the court, which is after the fact, and the standards by which you're trying them, seems to me to be a real problem. And I understand your argument is, well, it's better than nothing. But I'm not sure in the end it advances the ru a rule of law. So let's divide this into two. Actually, no, those of us who are in the military, we divide everything into three, but we'll divide this into two. We have the dudes who are with us, and we have the dudes who will be with us. So the question is, who do I owe a higher duty to at the moment? The guys who are, I have are those I'm going to capture tonight. I think, speaking practically, practically, legally, if there's such an expression, I clearly owe a duty to these dudes who I'm holding. And I imagine if you were to ask them, the overwhelming majority of them would tell you they would like to have some kind of resolution. Now, are they up to date as to their full constitutional rights? I don't know. But the idea of creating, in essence, two categories, present and future, and denying these guys some resolution because of concerns about ex post facto strikes me as, as problematic from the perspective of this triangle, this morality, decency, and, and, and law. I totally agree with you totally agree with you that we need to sit and have a long discussion about what are we going to do with those going forward. But I don't think the discussion about that in any way negates the, the responsibility to deal with these guys here. And if it's a two-step process, it's a two-step process. At the moment, it's a no-step process. And I think that that, that strikes me as, 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 as intellectually, philosophically, morally just untenable. I agree with you. Totally, practically speaking, I now create a process for these guys. It changes the rules of the game as compared to where it was when they were captured. Totally agree with you. On the other hand, not to create a process, um, particularly because I think it's clear to all of us that they're not going to be brought before a military commission. And that was the process in place. There were two options, right, when they were caught. One is the military commissions, one is the Article Three court. These guys are not going to be brought before military commissions. And so that leaves me then trying to find some kind of a, this is bad English, but some kind of a, a resolvable, viable compromise. Yes, ma'am. Our military commission is still operating. Well, our, military <laughs> our military commission is still operating at all. Not only are they still um, functioning, even though they're not trying anybody, but I understand from um, some blog yesterday, I think, or on Saturday, that there's now thought about bringing um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed before some kind of a military commission. Hi. Um, Are you a student? I am a student, Steve Warr. Um, you were talking about uh, the reasons that people are detained, the terrorism, the terrorists, mm -hmm. but I. This is what? Excuse me? Or individual, suspect, individual, individual suspected of involvement in terrorism. Of terrorism. And you said there were several reasons, but by my count, you only gave us one, which was caught in the act. 
Oh no, the other one is intelligence based on intelligence. Information. Okay, just based on based on intelligence. Correct. Okay. Um, what, so that was my first question. Second question: What do you think of the um, kind of charge that peep that, uh, for instance, the shooter in Fort Hood was engaged in terrorism? You know, that's a hell of a question. Um, right after Fort, Fort Hood happened, is, is the want in these things, I got tons of requests from the media to address Fort Hood. And I begged off because I wasn't totally convinced of exactly what had happened there. But I think it's pretty clear now that he was acting at the behest, complicated word behest, of the, the imam who was in Northern Virginia, who I understand is, was in Yemen, is no longer with us because I understand that the imam is in the world where all is good. I think that's clearly terrorism. Now, here we have a fork in the road. We have to ask ourselves and go back to the discussion in the terms of the papers that Silas got here. Is this domestic terrorism? I would say it is domestic terrorism because the relationship between the imam at the time and wherever it was in Alexandria, North Arlington, was clearly based in America. The act was committed in America. And that's a classic example of this idea of this treaty-based international terror court. I don't see Obama putting this guy in a plane and sending him to be tried, say, in The Hague. So that's domestic, that clearly is domestic terrorism. You see, like Timothy McVeigh, I mean, you know, as I talk about in the book, um, religious extremism presents the greatest danger, in my opinion, to, the, to civil democratic society today. Major Hassan is a clear example that acting at the behest of the imam needs to be tried in, in, in the U.S. Should he be court, I assume at the end of the, I assume what will happen with him once he's healthy, he'll be court-martialed. You know, he committed the act in uniform on a base, clearly court-martialed. Um, and it would be inappropriate from the perspective of the military to have him tried in an Article III court. So he's, he needs to be court-martialed. But that, that's, you know, the military commissions are for, not for soldiers. Um, court-martials acting under the um, Uniform Court of Military Justice, that's for soldiers. And he clearly falls into that rubric. So he would be inappropriate for an Article III court. He'd be inappropriate for an international court. So I, I want to push you on the international tribunals just a little bit. Um, because you've given us a reason why they're politically unviable, and I would agree with you, but I'm a student, so I don't always have to operate in realities. Um, and I'm, You're I'm, the law professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I'm curious if, there's a, if there is a more fundamental reason why international tribunals are a bad idea, in your opinion. Uh, to me, I guess the, the referent that I make is actually to Nuremberg, um, which, while problematic on a number of respects, um, Victor's justice being one of them, uh, was in some ways performative justice. Um, and I, I, I wonder if the International Tribunal, in this case of sort of a global problem in terrorism, doesn't have an, an analog there and a benefit um, that we can analogize to Nuremberg. Uh, that we might want to pursue them, at least theoretically, if not practically, due to the political considerations you've given us? It's not only political considerations, it's also, um, call it again, my term to Paul here, call it practical legal considerations. If you look at the FBI's definition of terrorism, and look at the State Department's definition of terrorism, and look at the Department of Homeland Security's definition of terrorism, the each have different definitions of terrorism, which means the executive branch, the United States government, amongst itself can't agree on what the hell terrorism is. According to the scholars Schmidt and Younger, there are 109 different definitions of terrorism considered viable by policymakers and by academics. Does that mean we'll now have 109 different terror ba treaty based terror courts? There are those who refer to terrorism as terrorism. There are those who refer to terrorists as freedom fighters. There are those who refer to terrorists as guerrillas. There are those who refer to terrorists as national liberators. Okay, so now I have four different subcategories. Sub I think the question of what is terrorism is such a politically loaded question that by the time we finish a discussion of how to define universally terrorism, we'll have X thousands more of these guys in detention. So 
in many ways, like my answer to Paul here, it, it may be that one day that will be the route to go. But I think more pressing is developing now a system to try those who we've detained. Could one foresee, for instance, um, this body that has a nice building in Manhattan, uh, the UN, um, prime real estate, coming up with some kind of a treaty-based terror international court? I don't know if you would call it politically unviable or realism, but I think that it's not practical and what worries me at all times not because I have sympathy for the terrorists or the individual suspect of terrorism don't get me wrong I don't suck because I have sympathy for them but because I am deeply concerned about the rule of law I think all of these discussions are fascinating but we need to have a practical resolution let me narrow narrow the scope perhaps um, I, granted that terrorism is a a vague term perhaps but it seems as though there are categories of terrorist acts upon which there is wide agreement that they are terrorist acts 9-11 the Madrid train bombings oh. the London bombings maybe even the attacks on the Taj Mahal Hotel in India um, not, only the, not, not only the Taj Mahal comes out you know the Chabad house I mean, there's a and so, uh, for in, at, with tribunals that we have now, not everyone gets tried. Um, and the trials tend to focus on those in charge who, uh, who give the orders to commit the crimes. So let me stop you for a little bit for a second. Yes. In a paper that, that Professor Blank and I wrote that I think is coming out sometime this year, um, Harvard National Security Journal, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, in the context of terrorism, who's, an act, who's the actor? So if you take the, the London train bombing, you'll tell me the guy who blew himself up. And I'll tell you, he's 25% he's of the picture. And that's all he is, is 25% of the picture. Take a suicide bombing. Everybody knows what a suicide bombing is, obviously, right? Okay. There are four distinct actors that make a suicide bombing happen. There's the bomber, you know, the guy who does this. I mean, he's not very interesting. There's the quarterback of the team, the guy who you know, puts the whole thing together. There's the guy responsible for the logistics, and then there's the financier. So one of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves is, in the context of those four very distinct categories, is who's a legitimate target, and when are you a legitimate target? So to look at Madrid, to look at London, to look at Bali, I mean, the examples, it's not enough to look at the, at the end product, the guy who blew himself up. But it's all those, those four distinct categories. Or in, you know, in the, um, the Gaza paradigm with the Qassam missiles, there, there are also four distinct categories, right? The smugglers, the bomb makers, the shooters, and then the landowners who are, who are facilitating the shooting of the missiles, the firing of the missiles. So the question of who's a, who's a legitimate target, Silas, you could bring in five international law experts, and you'll have 27 different definitions of who's a legitimate target. And then you'll have, bring in another four, and you'll have 52 different people telling you about when is a person a legitimate target? And in the meantime, we still haven't resolved, going back to this question here, we still haven't enabled these guys to have adjudication of their, of their responsibility. But, does the, but would an international tribunal for these sorts of events, uh, pre, I, I feel like it doesn't preclude domestic, coming to a domestic solution for the 25,000 oh. that we're holding. Right, but then you're going into a different area, which is a, which is a really important question, Silas. What are the limits of sovereignty, right? So in, I mean, you look, for instance, at the Goldstone Report, everybody, right? The Goldstone Report. There are those who are very critical of it, like I am. And I suggest that one of the fundamental intellectual failings of the Goldstone Report is that he minimizes state sovereignty because he minimizes the state's right to self-defense. So again, if you have this idea of this interna internationalization of, 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 of judicial resolution of terrorism, I think that has significant impact on the sovereign. Now, maybe that's not a bad thing may not be a bad thing, but again, I think I view it practically on two different levels. I think practically in terms of, is it really possible? And I think practically in terms of these guys behind me who are waiting to be brought before a judge. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to... Okay. Um, I want to go back to the Fort Hood thing and um, raise a question that I don't think has come up here 
in terms of figuring out why it is that international tribunals seem so challenged here. Um, and when you talked about, you said the Fort Hood gunman was clearly a terrorist, and yet you had no difficulty with the idea that he would be tried in a court-martial. All the other people that we've talked about who are suspected of being terrorists, there seems to be this gray area. They can't go here, they can't go there. Um, so it seems to me the question is, well, why is it so easy that he would go to a court-martial? Is it because he's a U.S. soldier? He has somewhere to go. He has a, like a puzzle piece. He's got his spot in the puzzle. So the next step then is to think about, well, why, why is this so hard with international tribunals? And to me it seems one issue that hasn't come up here is where are the crimes derived from? War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, all the crimes that are being tried in the international criminal tribunals, they derive from international law. To the extent they appear in domestic law, it's because they have been incorporated, implementing treaties into our domestic law. Terrorist crimes, correct me if I'm wrong, are essentially domestic crimes. They're crimes of violence. Bombing, look at, look at when you look at US statutes criminalizing terrorist acts, they're bombing, murder, mayhem, pillage and plunder, or whatever you want to call it, but they are not crimes that derive from international law. They are crimes, they're basic domestic crimes, it's just that we've added a component that has the terrorist additional layer added on because it has a purpose, it has a, um, a, a cause to it. Given that, is it inconceivable that an international tribunal could try these because every state will have derived these crimes from a different domestic criminal law concept, right? Um, and how could we come up with some overarching theme, whereas in the international criminal tribunals, there's an overarching theme of international law that draws civil and common law together, that draws different types of procedure together. People can find a way to resolve differences that way. Um, so I think with respect to Fort Hood, he's, he's easy to, to categorize because he's, he's an officer in the United States military commission committed a crime in the con in, while in service on a base, I think with a weapon issued by the military. I mean, he, Does it matter, therefore, that you call him terrorist? It makes no difference. No, but I, do I, I was asked, do I, do I think that's domestic terrorism? I think that is domestic terrorism, but he clearly needs to be, you know, be court-martialed. Because he's, I mean, he fits all the requirements for court martial. The idea of having some kind of an international, internationalization of, a, of the judiciary to, for the for purpose of trying terrorists, Again, it, it certainly sounds like, like, like an idea that's worth considering intellectually. But again, I, and I repeat, coming back to the, to the two previous questions, as interesting as the idea is, and perhaps maybe even it's a, not a bad idea, to implement the system will take so long that we will continue to violate basic rights of individuals. So I'm willing to do, have this interesting discussion about system A for these guys and system B for those guys, but we can't allow to be thinking about that while continuing to minimize their rights. Hi. Yes, um, I kind of have a political question kinda. more so than an inter international question. Which one do you want to begin with? The political oh, okay. Um, I wanted to, you started talking about Obama and the failure to take action on the closing of Guantanamo or just finding some solution right. to, do, to deal with these detainees. I'm wondering if you think that this is something that the general public is, is caring about, especially with the midterm elections coming up this year, that is it something that is people in the legal community are getting frustrated with, or is it something that, I mean, I, I feel like I haven't read a ton a, about it. I think it's a great question. I think, I don't mean this disrespectfully to anybody. I think Joe Schmo in, uh, in, Pe in Peoria, Illinois, Actually, that's not a good example because they may get a jail now in Peoria for the guys in Guantanamo, so he's not a good example. So Joe Schmo in, in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, okay? In plain and simple English, he doesn't give a shit. He's worried he wants food on the table for his kids. He's scared to death that he won't have a job. He's worried about college payments. He's worried about mortgage payments. And, and if his mom is sick, he really has SOL. On the other hand, on the other hand, the President of the United States and his administration, 
he raised his hand on the 20th of January at noon to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And the fact that the guy in Fargo, North Dakota, is distracted in no way excuses the president. I'll tell you this. When I told you earlier that I met with the White House task force in June, July. So there, too, I heard you know, a variety of issues. And I said, you guys have to decide. I mean, decision making is hard. You know, I remind all of us, in the Gore-Bush debate, Bush said, this job is hard. So I watched and I thought to myself, well, no shit, of course it's hard. You don't want the job, you don't want the job. Nobody makes you take it. And so I have no sympathy whatsoever for, for difficulty in decision making. You gotta make the decision. And if, we, if the guy in North Dakota goes to sleep tonight and says, oh man, you know, we got 25,000 detainees who haven't been brought to trial, he ain't worried about that. But the president has a higher obligation, a higher duty. Do you think, sorry, do you think part of the reason that some might find this so egregious on, on Obama's behalf is that his background as a constitutional law scholar and that he had seemingly so much support from the legal community and that he was going to, at least during the campaign, said he was going to be upholding these principles, right. perhaps so, more so than the previous administration. Uh, Obama is the beneficiary of, uh, of, I think, of a couple of things. One, that he, from the perspective of the press, right? One, that he's not Bush. And two, the press clearly was in his corner. I'm not sure today the press is in his corner as much as it was. Um, the press has, has, has um, undergone an interesting tr transformation here with him. Whether Obama was a constitutional law scholar, which I don't think he would refer to himself, refer to himself as a constitutional law scholar. I mean, he taught a, class, a couple of classes at Chicago, but he wasn't a constitutional law scholar. He swore to uphold the Constitution. I mean, it's as simple as that. He also, um, he's got to make a decision. I mean, we're paying him, what, $250,000 a year. He's got that nice house, got nice digs in Washington. Um, he's got to decide. A for B. Right. And, um, and I guess what I'm, I'm just trying to brainstorm out loud, whether or not I can have then the Article 3 imprimatur, because I, I, don't, I didn't hear whether you have a right to appeal. Mm -hmm. You do. You have yes, a right sir. to appeal in your... In your to an independent judiciary all the way up. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and evidence rules? With the exception of the Confrontation Clause, the same as. Same as. So hearsay rules, presumably... Same. Which raises a huge problem when it's, in, when, it's in, when it's information based on sources, which is all about hearsay. Right. But I wonder whether there is then a, a negotiation that could take place. <coughs> and, you know, I, I think about multi district litigation where what you do is you then divide that 25,000 into subclasses, maybe four or five subclasses, and that what you do is you try representative cases to find out how they try. But and then you go back to the group and you negotiate a, a set of procedures. But the criminal defense, the, 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 the criminal law paradigm in whichever articulation is predicated on individual actions, right? Right. So there's a problem here with this kind of a, this idea. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. There's a problem with a class action in the criminal context. The criminal context. I agree. Right. And, and so but it does seem to me that what you're doing is you're trying to formulate something that is not quite a classic criminal procedure. It's going to make some compromises there and wonder whether there is an idea there that in a sense that could be negotiated or weighed by counsel after some consultation with then subgroups of the, of the 25,000 that potentially then gives it legitimacy because they're waving into it. Silas, there's your, ne there's, there's your next conference. That's a really interesting idea. but. The question is, how do you do, just a second, ma'am, the question is, how do you do, I call it adjudication or examination of, the, of each, each and every person's role? I've got to think about that. Yes, ma'am. Every day that goes by, we get farther and farther away from any kind of conviction beyond a reasonable doubt of anything. What about if we just forget about what they did and determine if they are still individually Based on that's, uh, well, there must be a definition of what a national security risk, and if there isn't, since we're talking only about the future, determine that because we'll never be able to tie them to what they did. I mean, that's just plain reality. What are you going to do? And we don't have a chance to do it. 
So in essence, with <coughs> this is really interesting. The same thing is we're trying to protect ourselves, right? Right. So what you're really suggesting is, is a different spin or different articulation on indefinite detention or to do a, a mass release program. To do, um, you know, let bygones be bygones. And now we're going to sit around the campfire, hold hands, sing kumbaya. So I can tell you this, in my former life when I served in the Israel Defense Forces, I was involved in prisoner releases, not prisoner exchanges, but prisoner releases. So I remember reviewing the actions of each and every one of these guys, some of them who are really nasty people. And then you have to come before the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as the High Court of Justice and explain you know, this and explain that. Uh, does the public accept that with open arms and a warm embrace? No. And I think that if the President of the United States were to go on TV tonight, because he was in Cleveland today talking about health care. So now he's in Cleveland, he's going on TV and said, my fellow Americans, in the generosity, in the age of generosity and understanding, I'm going to let all these guys go home. I wouldn't want to be a Democrat running for Congress in November. Well, right. So I asked a judge who sits on these hearings, the habeas hearings, who I met a couple of weeks ago. And I said, I got to ask you a question. What are the criteria for determining if X presents a continuing threat to America's national security? I want to know the criteria. And because I'm, I'm, I am of age, I've done this you know, for 20 years of my life, I said, and don't sell me a story. I want to know the criteria. And the response I got was the following. Professor Giora, that's a really good question, which is a euphemism for, I have no idea. I found that very, I mean, she was brutally honest with me. And I, thank, you know, I thought that was fabulous, but I, that's disheartening. Cool. All right, well, if there aren't any further questions, if everyone would join me in thanking Professor Giora for visiting with us.